Dr. Rich Ebner. Hope you're all doing well. Once again, back for yet another Get Rich Live live stream here on YouTube. This week's topic is writing with and emotions. So kind of that relationship or how we do that with in certain ways. So how's everybody doing? I um, hope you're, again, doing well. We uh, have a couple more streams lined up for the entire term. And like I said, I've been loving these um, nice guest conversations we've been having throughout the term and previous terms. And yeah, hoping to do a few more of those before we round out the year. I think we have roughly a month left of classes and so forth. So not that much. Um, so just hang in there while you're working on your projects. And, you know, we're sort of uh, managing a variety of storms here on campus and outside. So before we get, begin our main topic, I want to discuss a few items, um, as is now tradition on the show. Uh, I'd like to once again thank Writing Center Director John Suffren and the Writing Department for supporting another term of Get Rid Live. If you'd like to see any past live streams, you can see them right here on the page before me. So we have the full schedule and um, our uh, assistants with the Writing Center, our student assistants are also linking to links that we have to the series and as they're posted. So last week we talked about the value of slow writing. So sort of what that entails when you try to pace yourself a little differently, um, kind of in the face of the rapid, speedy kind of posting that we're experiencing out here in the world. Um, and we also talked about reviewing anti-racist publishing practices and editorial guidelines. So if you click on this link, you can see that. As I mentioned before, um, we had to cut that a little bit short, but I'm also happy to announce that on the actual YouTube page now, you can see an interview that I did with uh, Louis Maduba about the um, environment from A to Zine is uh, well underway now. So we have that going on. Um, we have some cool things uh, coming up. Check that out when you get a chance. It's a great interview. It's about 16 minutes. And that was a sort of makeup to the last cancellation we had as, as a group. Okay, um, so let's talk about that. And also just want to mention if you are thinking about any one-on-one -on -one appointments at the Writing Center, you can find a link here in the, the description. We also have drop-in sessions and sessions with our accessibility specialists. Um, there's also 24-hour sessions we also have. So um, main topic for the day we have is writing with and emotions. Um, lots of stuff we can get into. So in a little bit, we'll have a guest chat with uh, novelist and screener Sarah Tarkov. And Sarah, I can see you there in the background. So hello, I'm waving to you. Um, if you just, just want to stand by for a minute, I want to say just a couple things and then I'll introduce you. If that, that sounds good. Um, so I'll come back to this after our conversation with Sarah. But um, one thing that I want to mention is that this whole topic reminded me of, a, of the web application Calmly Writer, which I talked about. Um, in a previous stream on minimalist writing platforms. So I don't know about you all, but I admit I get flustered and frustrated really easily when I'm working on a massive project where I just can't get through that line. And so when I was demoing Calmly Writer, for example, um, on the previous stream, you kind of see how it sort of dismisses a lot of the formatting and so forth that you would see with word processors. So again, given that it's about calmness and it's sort of trying to evoke that, Definitely recommend this one. Not making any commission or anything like that. It's a it's a free download, and there's also a um, pay one sort of license that's um, available too. And that was developed by Yusuf Hassan and Amal Amrani. So once again, happy to plug that for them. Um, it was a really cool project, and I'm excited to work with more of it. And you can check that out again on our stream from February second. Um, this application is also interesting to me because it discusses the relationship between the writer and the tools that we use, right, to, to get work done. And this kind of question about writers and, you know, uh, feelings and so forth has been really interesting to me as a researcher as well. Um, in the past couple of years, I've been doing research uh, and interviewing writers, you know, for Writer's Digest and other writing magazines. And there are just two quick passages I wanted to share with you all. Um, one was from George R. R. Martin that came up in, in our interview. Um, this is actually a couple of years ago, so now I'm dating myself. It's about 2012 that we started started talking about this. And where did I, where did they say this on the screen? I gotta find that real quick. 
close on page. Anyways, it's right around here. Um, and I forgot to highlight that where that was, but essentially in this interview and it's, it's linked in the resources as well as well page, but he says, it's interesting for a guy my age to reflect on how different my working methods have become since the 1970s. When I was writing everything on a typewriter, there was a great deal less revision then because it was so cumbersome. I think the ease of restructuring and repolishing on a computer leaves one to do more of it. And so I think I had asked him about how much revision he's doing throughout this. Yeah, it was on page 39, you can see here. And um, generally he doesn't work through, you know, multiple drafts. He just slowly tries to carve that first draft out by line editing as he goes. So again, that relationship between maybe tools and so forth has shaped his process. Um, and then uh, Patrick Rothfuss, I had also interviewed him a couple of years ago too. He's another uh, fantasy sort of world builder. And, Sarah, I'd be very curious to see what you have to say about some of the stuff too um, later on. But Patrick Rothfuss, I asked some, some similar questions about revision and so forth and what the next steps were for a draft. And as he says here on page 44 in this issue from 2015, step away from the project for a while because to get to the end of that draft, you've had to become extraordinarily tangled up in your writing. Emotionally, you're way too close to the project and you need to get a little space from it because as he goes on to say, the next thing that is required is editing. Sometimes you can give it to someone else and they read it. And since they cannot be too close to it, you feel that person's emotions uh, distance from your story. So again, stepping away and thinking about, we can kind of reset our feelings about a piece if we just give it some time. So like uh, these writers, you've probably encountered work through a range of feelings during a project, whether it's a, you know, draft of a essay or it's a, it's a final project or something like that. And different genres have sort of different ways of thinking about feelings. So objectivity and passive voice, you might see in the lab report, a shot was given at 10 AM every day for a month to patients while others foreground first person opinions or perspectives. When I wrote for a newspaper, Sin Weekly, for example, we were encouraged to focus on the positive aspects of our subjects. Uh, that approach, it helped with advertising and it supported the paper's mission to help retain young professionals in the city. If you wanna know more about that, feel free to ask me at another time. Um, it was definitely an interesting experience, kind of writing under the house style and the voice um, required of, of writers. And that was a long time ago. I, I admit I kind of miss it working for a newspaper. Okay. So a lot of overview we've given. Um, that's enough about me though, and about these processes. Uh, like I said, we have Sarah Tarkoff on the line here and uh, we're gonna introduce her in just a minute. Um, I wanna say just a few words about Sarah, your amazing work. So let me put this up on the screen and we can talk just for a minute um, about this. Okay, so here's what we have, I'm gonna say. Um, Sarah, Given her bio and so forth, I want to cover some of this. Um, Sarah loves big sci-fi worlds, grounded relationship stories, and anything that combines the two. Tarkov is the author of the uh, trilogy Eye of the Beholder through Harper Voyager, which includes the books Sinless, Fearless, and Ruthless. And as the book um, goes on to say uh, in the description, in Grace Luther's world, we learn mortality is physically enforced. Those who are good are blessed with beauty, while those who are not suffer horrifying consequences, disfigurement, and even death. Um, Sarah is also writing currently for the show Roswell, New Mexico, and her other TV credits include Star Trek, Strange New Worlds, Arrow, Mistresses, and Witches of East End. And I'll totally admit that I became a huge fan of Sarah's work when I started watching Arrow on CW, uh, even more so when I listened to the audiobook of Sinless, especially that prologue line with the, the big thing that happens. You know, I don't want to give anything away, but it was, it was very powerful. Uh, for me, especially in audio form. Uh, she has such a knack for describing the feelings that bond and complicate friendships, enemies, and omniscient forces. She graduated from the University of Southern California with a degree in screenwriting, and I'm happy to call her a good friend of mine. So Sarah, welcome. Bring you here on the stream. Hey. Thank you so much for having me. That was such a kind intro. Thank you. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Hi, everybody. Okay. Hi, and you're joining us from Pittsburgh, right? I am, yeah. It's, it's snowing out there, but there was a lot of glare. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I guess we're going to expect that up here in Toronto, too. So <laughs> glad, you're, 
uh, you're staying safe. So I'm so glad you could join us for this conversation. Um, yeah. And I know that, yeah, we, we get a lot of folks uh, who come in on the stream and then check it out later. So I think this will be a really um, exciting conversation. So I sent you a list of questions. Should we get yes. into them? Yeah, that... absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. So oh, and I, this... I, I, oh I, I was listening to the thing you said about your friend, the um, other writer who says, oh, I come back to to my work. I wanted to say I absolutely do that too. And I wanted to offer sort of a psychological logic to it. Yeah, go is, ahead. When I'm writing something, I'm very close to it. I'm like, every word is precious. Like, you know, I, I, I have the emotional experience of being like, I love this line. It's so funny. And then, you know, if I read something I wrote like a year ago, I'm not necessarily associating myself as the writer of the thing. I'm just reading it as like, oh, someone wrote this book or whatever. What, what did this person have to say? And so it, it allows you the distance to be like, to judge it more objectively as opposed to just being so attached to everything that you wrote. That's my, mm -hmm. that's my take on it at least, so. Yeah, and um, I imagine you've done, you've done pieces. Uh, I'm gonna move us over on the screen just a little yeah. bit so we can see that's going to echo that. I've got to do all the broadcasting as you do here on the in the YouTube worlds. So let's uh, let's hide that and then we can. Yeah, there we go. So you'll change a little bit. There we go. Um, all right. Now I can see you. Uh, yeah, I imagine that actually doing something where you've submitted it, you've gotten feedback, you know, for me, at least, like I get that sting sometimes when I get the feedback from yeah. um, someone that says, you yeah, know, maybe this is not quite it, what I'm looking for. And I just have to sit with it for a while. Let's put it in the like for real like bookshelf or in a folder and just step away. It's, it's crucial for is that something kind of you do. Oh, that, ab absolutely. Thing? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I have heard other people say, you know, you need like the time to grieve the notes to be like, ugh. Uh, and you know, yeah. and a lot of time it's like, you know, I, I got notes on a project back recently and, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of things where I was like, I had gotten the note from other readers before and I had sort of been worried. I was like, is anyone going to notice this thing? And, you know, then they noticed the thing and you're like, oh, I didn't succeed in, in tricking them into thinking that this was working. And so, you know, uh, it takes time to sort of process it because I think you have like, at least for me. I have sort of my feeling of what I want it to feel like. And, you know, it sort of comes mm -hmm. out as this sort of like, sorry, my eye, uh, sort of fully, you have this, this, this conception of what it should be. And then the notes require you to sort of, you know, go in and uh, mm -hmm. now I'm really, something's really gotten in my eye. I'm so sorry that you all. It's a me. snowflake. Yeah. Oh, Zoom is, Zoom is worse. Um, yeah. Uh, so sorry. Okay. Here we go. Oh, good. Oh, good. No problem. <laughs> Um, basically that like, for me, the initial like first draft process is a very feelings oriented thing where I'm like, oh, I really feel what the scene should be. I feel what the character should do. And then when you get notes back and it's like, okay, well, what if this character came in earlier mm -hmm. and all of that, where then, then the, this, the, the revision process is often like a very intellectual thought mm -hmm. kind of process that, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, you have to change gears and, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. we're better at one than the other. One second, I'm going to grab a clean Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'll just say I've, I've been on a stream here before and I had to cancel it midstream because I, I got sick. So you mm -hmm. were, you were making me feel like I'm in a good company, you know, but, yeah, right. so, but, but please take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it was just, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so let me ask you, I mean, that's really interesting about just working on uh, your own projects, but you know, you're doing a lot of work in a writer's room, as I understand, we've yeah. talked about quite a bit like off off the show. Um, and you've lately been working in the writer's room for Roswell, New Mexico. Um, can you give us a, a sense of what that's like to work in a writer's room? And I, I can imagine like a lot of ideas and feelings are kind of flying around you know, in one session to the next. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about a writer's room is it's very structured. You have the showrunner who, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes created the show, sometimes didn't, but they're, you know, they're they're the head writer. They're the one through, you know, all those sort of creative mm -hmm. stuff flows through them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then there's the structure of, you know, then there's the person below them and the person below them. And there's a, there's a very clear hierarchy where like they leave the room and then the next the person who's you know next high up next highest up is then in charge and you know it's it's very useful because i think when you have because there'll be even be 10 people in a room and it's useful to set to, to have and it's, and it's usually based on experience you know mm -hmm. you you 
you know, when you start off as a writer, usually I started off as, as an assistant, you know, like the stereotypical like person who gets the coffee in Hollywood mm -hmm. and then uh, worked my way up. So you become a staff writer and then there's a bunch of different other levels up through the various levels of producer. Um, and, you know, when you're first starting out, it's useful to, to, because you have so many voices, it's useful to just be able to be like, okay, I, I have this idea, I'm gonna pitch it. And then it, either someone says yes or no, the, the person at the top either says yes or no. And you, and if they say yes, you go down that line. If they say no, you don't. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's, it keeps the conversation very streamlined because people, mm -hmm. you know, if you have 10 people, 10, di you have 10 different versions of what people think the show should be and what people think mm -hmm. the episode should be and the storyline should be. And you know, the, the more experience you have generally, the more you're able to, and this isn't necessarily true, obviously different. Yeah. As we all know, uh, experience and uh, position don't necessarily mean you're better. But you know, mm -hmm. the idea would be that if you can, if you if you've had a lot of experience, you maybe you know better what the showrunner wants because ultimately it all comes down to you know the staff writer might be have the most brilliant idea, but if the showrunner if that's not what the showrunner wants to do, that's not what you're going to do. And so mm -hmm. um, you know, and and ultimately it's really important that that works that way because. Uh, otherwise, you don't get a cohesive vision for the show. So basically, the, a day to day experience is like you know you go. It's basically a conference room with a bunch of whiteboards. Like you know, literally, it's you know, four walls of whiteboards, or maybe three in a window or whatever. But um, and this is in person. Obviously, there's we've been on Zoom for a while, and so I'm just going to describe the in person one because it's more fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. So it's, you know, we're just sitting around a conference room and, you know, the, the showrunner will say like, okay, you know, your job today is to break episode four. And, you know, I want episode four to be about, you know, the, the, the bad guy, I'm gonna try, if it's like an episode of Arrow, I want the bad guy to be, you know, this guy from DC Comics who uses scissors. This is a, this is not a real example. Um, mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, let's look up this guy, this, this DC Comics villain, he uses scissors. What are ways we can use scissors? Um, I should have picked a different example, but, you know. Um, and then we'll all pitch uh, on different, different things that the villain could do. And, you know, again, it all sort of filters up where, you know, the, the person who's the sort of second or third in command who's left in charge is is the one who's sort of taking all these ideas and saying like, okay, yes, no, let's the room go down this way. And we'll, and really the room will, as a group, will come up with sort of what the basic premise of the episode will be often. Um, once the showrunner has approved that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, it's a, we're going to have a big fight down at the docks. And so then, and then, mm -hmm. we, and then production says, no, we can't get the docks set. Can you, can you set it on a train? We, you can't afford a train. It's not a train, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. so, so, you know, it's some of it comes down to what production can afford and can, can do well. So, you know, at Arrow, it was a lot of, you know, there, there were a lot of warehouses in Vancouver, so we did a lot of warehouses. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so so as a room, we we come up with you know what the storyline is going to be, what the character arcs are going to be. Um, maybe we know that in episode six, uh, there's a the two characters are going to kiss, so we're going to make sure. Okay, let's let's weave in you know them having a little bit of a flirtation thing here to set up that they're going to kiss in a couple episodes, you know, things like that. Um, and so as a group, we and you end up with. Um, essentially like a beat sheet for the episode so on the on the board um well it'll be like okay you know here's all the scenes in the episode so act one will have you know we'll start in the mayor's office and you know oliver will have this conversation with felicity and then we go to this scene and then we go to this you know so 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 a, a really rough outline of what the episodes mm -hmm. will be and then you know at, at each stage the showrunner comes in and approves or says no i hate to throw it all out now we want a different villain that uses Boons, I don't know. Um, and so I love all these villains. I would just like if you could write a compelling villain with scissors or spoons. There are some crazy <laughs> villains out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so then basically once once the final episode is approved, then whoever is assigned, whoever's name is on the episode, they usually leave to go write the episode. So they'll write um, usually the network wants a story area, which is like a, you know, two to four page document saying like, okay, here's, here's sort of our pitch for the episode. And mm -hmm. then they'll, um, then, they'll, then you, when that's approved, you send it an outline and mm -hmm. then, which is basically taking what's on the board, the, that beat sheet and developing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally last stages, you'll write the script and you know, different, different rooms have different, um, uh, 
sort of ways that they do things. You know, some, mm-hmm. some showrunners, like you turn in a script and like, okay, that's a nice start and they'll completely rewrite it. And that's just how that's what they're like. Aaron Sorkin is notorious for that being his process. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some, some showrunners are, uh, much more hands off and what you write is much more what appears on the screen. And, you know, a lot of shows I've been on, like, you know, whoever's name is on the episode, it doesn't necessarily matter. Like everyone, right. You know, everyone will write two scenes and, you know, <laughs> every episode is, is that, you know, it's sort of a group written episode. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the basic gist. Did I, did I cover everything that you, I, I think so. Very interesting. I mean, uh, I'm just impressed that there are so many paths, um, that happen, you know, from ideation all the way to even before you even start really writing, writing, you know, so to say, like you've got someone who's like, oh, we're gonna do this. No, nope, we're gonna go this way now. All right, we can't do this. There's so many other forces besides, like, I mean, production, I didn't even consider yeah. that. Someone go, we can't do that. It's not like, a, it's not in a feasible place. Um, yeah, it, it, it was like a lot of call from Todd and everyone's like, oh no, and Todd, it's just like Todd the line producer. And you're like, oh, yeah. we can do blah, blah, blah. So, you know. Um, yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun environment. And, you know, and it's, and it's, I think it's also useful because like I said, like that first draft feeling, I think, I think when people get into writing initially, there's this like, oh, I, I just sort of instinctively know what I want. I know what it should feel like. I have this scene in my mind and, and it, you know, comes out a certain, and you just have it, you have this sort of instinct about what you want the story to be. And that's, that's part of what makes you a, a good writer is like, you have those instincts. But I think when you're in a room, you have to develop this secondary skill, which is looking and analyzing those instincts and saying, okay, why do I want it to be this way? Mm. And then you have to then justify it and explain it to someone else who has completely different instincts from you. And, right. And-, and, and sometimes you, you can say like, I can say like, okay, like, but these two characters need to kiss in episode six. And so if he doesn't have this conversation with her, then we don't set that up. And then you know, the other person's saying like, well, you know, he has this rivalry with Scissors Man and he wouldn't be doing this because he would be focused on Scissors Man and we're both right. And we have to find a way to make the, to merge those two instincts. And ultimately, mm-hmm. that, and that's, I think the value of having the room is that you have all these people with these different instincts and different storytelling strengths and you can kind of bring it all together. Yeah, it, it is a a fine and really important example of uh, collaboration. How it like often yeah. has to work in you know messy, interesting, and you know challenging ways. So yeah, Absolutely. thanks for sharing that story. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you've been writing a lot of dialogue and scenes for characters in TV shows and things like that. Um, I was wondering how you approach writing those those kind of dialogues um, and and scenes. Um, that you want to be maybe more emotional. You mentioned like the kissing scene, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but what's like one scene from your work? I mean, I know we've done um, a lot of scripting and so forth, but any, anything that comes to mind in terms of trying to tap into uh, an emotion or, or something like that that you, you wanted to make sure came across? Um, I'm trying to think of a specific scene. Um, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, so much of what you're writing is like, often it's like an idea someone else had. So like, Mm. you know, you're, you're sort of looking at like, you know, Mm -hmm. how do I accomplish this thing that, you know, the showrunner has this vision of, uh, you know, of the scene being this way. Um, Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, ask me the question again. I apologize. No, no, no. Just how you how you how you maybe written a scene that uh, a scene that comes to mind that was like particularly like emotional. And maybe the, a different way I can ask it is, um, you know, when you've seen an episode air that has your words that you like, you know, sort of helped cultivate. Like, how maybe I could just ask it this way: um, How do you feel when you hear someone speak your words like on the screen? It's, it's exciting. I mean, it's it's. It's exciting, but also like it, I remember when my first episode filmed. Uh, you know, it, it was really exciting to see the actors bring it to life, and sometimes they bring things that are so exciting that you never would have thought of, and they and they sell a line, and you know, um, and sometimes they change little words, and you're like, oh, actually, that's a better way of doing it because it sounds more natural. Yeah. Sometimes you're like, hey, well, you ruined the lot, you know, and sometimes and sometimes they <laughs> like, take a performance in a direction where you're like you just ruined my scene. I love that scene. I'm so mad. Um, <laughs> you know, it, and it, it can really vary. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think like when you're, what I've found when I'm writing dialogue and trying to get to the, to the emotional reality of it is 
for me, and I, I know lots of people where they're really writing from the outside in, where they're they're sort of just observing how people are and and writing it sort of from that perspective. And I know a lot of people who are really talented writers who absolutely come at that from that perspective. But like, for me, if I'm not inside the character's head and feeling what they're feeling, then it's not gonna come out the way I wanted it to come out. Like it's gonna come out as mm-hmm. this sort of like cliched or like just just not I think accurately representing it's going to come out as like my view of who they are as opposed to for that character who they actually are um mm-hmm. and I think that you know and, and again like the actors will will put their spin on it and you know the actor will always look at it as like through the through the lens of themselves and how they can you know empathize with this because they're doing the same thing they have to get inside and feel what this character mm-hmm. is feeling and so you know sometimes that's hard you know, if it's a character that's very different from them or, you know, often I think for an actor, it's like, it's almost harder if it's a character that's like similar to them, that's like going through a thing mm-hmm. that they haven't quite finished processing yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like I think for, for me, I think some of the, some of the most interesting actors to me are the ones who can play villains really, uh, really well, because it means that they've sort of looked at that part of them. They're like aware of that part of themselves. Um, which is, I think, something that's hard to do as you, like, we want to view ourselves as these, like, positive, Mm -hmm. we want to view ourselves in this sort of positive light, Mm -hmm. but often, you know, that that we all have parts of ourselves that are not nice, and so the the actors that can play villains are the ones who have, like, really delved into that, for better or worse, I think. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, but I often really (laughs) like to play villains, because they're like, they're like, yeah, I'm cool, I've, I've figured out my, you know, psyche a little more. Wow, how about that? Um, Although not all of them, some of them are just not. You know, it, 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 <laughs> everyone's. You never know. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason why I see like a, a lot of like, actors just like are hostile like the villain in certain movies because they're just just good at it. They're good at like being yeah. yeah that way. Um, do you mind if we turn to a question in the chat that someone was asking? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was kind of something I was thinking about as well um, when you were talking about uh, actors and sort of uh, how they sort of speak your lines. And we talked yeah. a little bit earlier about. You know, managing those kind of moments where you're you're trying to negotiate in the writer's room. But yeah. um, DM is asking, uh, as the writer, are you involved in briefing the actors about what kinds of emotions you had in mind for the scenes? And that's it's also interesting. I had thought about like you're going and seeing the thing shooting. Yeah. When are you allowed to say things like that? Like, are yeah. You know, so or... so it's really interesting. It's a great question because yes and no. So there's rules. Um, so the DGA, which is the Directors Guild, the the, the union for directors, has very specific rules on what you are and aren't allowed to say. Like mm-hmm. if the scene is shooting, you know, if it, you know, we're take take one, take two, mm-hmm. and you want, uh, and you're like, oh, they're not performing it right. You're not allowed to. T- you as the writer, uh, especially also when you're on set, you're you're not just you're a writer producer usually. So like even if you're not mm-hmm. even if you don't have producer in your title, the act of being a writer on set is producing. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you and the and and you are there as a representative of the showrunner who is technically everyone's boss so like mm-hmm. right, so there's a weird ranking thing where you're like i'm the new person and no one really knows me and you know maybe i'm a staff writer and this is my first time ever working in television but i'm mm-hmm. the representative of the showrunner so i have to give this it, it's a it's a weird sort of power mm-hmm. dynamic but mm-hmm. leaving all that aside so if i if i'm the writer on set producing my episode and you know the, the actors like crying and they're not supposed to be crying and i know that they're not supposed to be crying i can't say that directly i i talk to the director i'm sitting next to the director and i say hey like you know they're crying too much this is not you know th- this is this should be a happy scene Can, um you know and then and then the the director will say okay great and they'll go talk to the actor um and they'll have that mm-hmm. but that's but that's a directing guild thing is like because if i were to step in and talk to the actor in that moment directly then i'm sort of usurping their role because the director's job is to have those conversations with the actors that said, um, you know, I, it often is in a larger sense. If that, if that, um, I'll be there in terms of like when they're rehearsing the scene before before we start shooting. They'll they'll rehearse the scene. They'll block the scene, um, and so you know, if the actors are having any questions about like you know, what am I what am I feeling in this moment, like what you know, and and then in those. Mm-hmm. In those situations, I would often have a, a larger conversation that's not like directing their performance and saying like, don't cry, don't, you know, like, like I wouldn't be giving those kinds of notes, but I would be saying like, okay, so, you know, last episode you felt this way because your girlfriend broke up with you and now this scene you're feeling, you know, so, so you're, you're bringing that 
into it and maybe here's where you're going to go in the future and you know this is this is what we've been, this is sort of what the writers are trying to say about your character this season this is what we want you know th this, mm -hmm. is, this is where you are and so um in a more general sense yes um you would have those conversations but usually almost always with the director present and you know it, you, you just want to make sure that you're not crossing a line and taking on someone else's like you don't want to steal someone else's job like you're yeah. there to, to, to support them more than anything else. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I just I have, again, having not done that, I just imagine like if you're writing something and it's not going the way you imagine, it's, you know, maybe, I, I don't know. I, I think at first for me, it'd just be so hard not to say something like, oh, I just want to, you know, but you know, those layers so that they're involved in these kind of scenes. Um, sort of um, in this industry. So that's very insightful. Thank you. Yeah. And again, um, I think I think the fact that it is a group project, like, you know, there were 10 other people involved in breaking this episode and write and often writing it. And, you know, you, you, I, at least for me, if it's, if it's, you know, just an episode of television, I don't necessarily feel the same ownership mm -hmm. of it or the same, like, oh, it's my precious words. You know, it, it's, it's, I think, and I think it's helpful to have that perspective in terms of being like, okay, we're a group, we're trying to accomplish this creative goal together. What is my, you know, what is, you sort of put the, the goal sort of becomes your God where you're all like subservient to the to the creative work itself. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, that, that helps me take myself out of it where I'm like, okay, I wrote this line, I love this line, the line's not playing, Get, well, let's come up with a new line, you know, <laughs> like, right, right. Yeah. you know, it's, it's very much, it, it, it's it's a nice sort of exercise in sort of removing my ego from the process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, well. This has been great. Um, let's you, let's turn to just to chat about your uh, novel work because I think that's a yeah, very different, yeah. you know way. Um, let me just get that back up on the screen real quick. Uh, one second, we've got this untitled thing. This one the give a little plug to the uh to the series uh, all that sort of stuff um so a trilogy you know that you had the eye of the beholder series i mean it's largely following um grace luther and you know as she's sort of been described like a and I've, I've come to learn like a brave young woman who risked everything to expose conspiracy controlling her world um and in this case like yes you've gone through sort of discussions with editors and in multiple drafts and so forth. But this is really your your thing. Um, let me just move this down a little bit so you can see. And I was just wondering if you could describe the process of staying with a character for three books. I mean, this is not one that you can really, that could speak back to you or <laughs> this sort of director yeah. and our directors can. Um, this is you kind of just work you know, you and uh, the character alone, you're sort of, you've established this relationship with and written with. Um, yeah, what's what's right. that been like for you? I mean, it's interesting. So when I started the series, I had a sense of, you know, where I wanted to take this character. And so, you know, I started her in one place and I was like, okay, I know she's ending in this other place. So they sort of try, you, you want to have it be like polar opposites. I think I perhaps went a little too far in terms of, you know, making her a little too, you know, weak at the beginning, knowing that she would be strong at the end. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I, uh, it, it is definitely this, this sense of knowing that, you know, this person is like, is the, the, the window into the series and is the person that people are going to be identifying with. And, you know, that, that I think you really have to have as a writer empathy for your characters, because if you don't have empathy for them, no one else will. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think you can take a character who is, you know, maybe the least likable person, but if you, if you find the empathy for them, then, you know, the, the reader will too. That's, that's the, the hope at least. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think, you know, with, with Grace's character, you know, she's, you know, it, it's, it's in many ways a story of, of being that 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 like moment where you step out into the world and you're like oh i thought i knew everything but the world is so much bigger and more complicated and scarier than i ever thought it would be mm -hmm. and then sort of her you know stepping up into how can i be a part of this big big scary world and, and everything um mm -hmm. so you know i i think for me 
it was an inter- and it was also an interesting journey because books are so long, a trilogy is so long that like mm-hmm. you know, yeah. really have a grasp on like everything that's going to happen in the end when you're starting at the beginning and you know so and and again like I'm used to writing scripts which are so much shorter and like to me I, I, in terms of content for me a book feels more like a season of television worth of content like a short season right. like six episodes or whatever worth of content mm-hmm. for, like you know which is which is just so much more plot and character and movement and mm-hmm. tension that you have to build and um you know it, it, I also was writing these books while I was on had a full-time job on Arrow and I was just exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> it just feels like I look at those books and I'm just like, God, oh, that was a marathon. I can't believe I finished that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you were, so yeah, you were working full-time. Like, when did you, did you write this like in the evenings and so forth? Yeah, and... basically I wrote it evenings, weekends. And like, I think that the big thing to me is it's not necessarily time to write because, you know, there's plenty of time in the day. If you're like, I will work evenings and weekends, there's time. But the, the, the thing to me is like, so much of writing is that sort of downtime where you're just like, I'm out on a walk and like, it's sort of churning in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. And like that, that actually requires a lot of bandwidth. And mm-hmm. for me, earlier in my career, I was like, I can do two projects at a time. I can be thinking about two projects at a time. And now I'm like, no, one project at a time. <laughs> like if I want to <laughs> fully make this project the best it can be, it's, I'm like, this is the only thing I can think about. And like, I'll be working on multiple projects. You know, like right now I've got, you know, two or two or three things that I am sort of thinking about in the back of my head. But in terms of being like, okay, this is the thing I'm writing right now. Like I have one project I'm writing right now. And then when I'm done with that, I'll go to the next one. So mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, just, just being able to say like, and, 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 you know, when I was, um, and so I had all these ideas that I was sort of building up while I was on Roswell and now we are on hiatus, which is lovely. Uh, and so getting, getting to work on these other projects is really nice. Yeah. You've, you've had some distance from it. You can come back to it sort of. That's, that's great. Um, it just reminds me, uh, I know one question I sort of sent to you was what's your, what's your sort of daily process been like in the last like month or so? Um, and I was just wondering out of curiosity, you could speak to that, but, uh, you were talking about the bandwidth of thinking when you're not even writing, just kind yeah. of, still that writing time. Um, do you do anything like, uh, record notes to yourself while you're driving or walking? Like, uh, I just had a, a curiosity. No, I will, um, like I'll often have an idea, like I'll go for like a walk in the park in the morning if I'm, uh, not, if I'm, if I'm not on a show and I'm just like, oh, I'm working, yeah. you know, but that, that's sort of my morning routine. And, uh. If, if on that, I'll often have like a thought as I'm, you know, going for a jog or whatever, and I'll just, I'll come back and I'll just, jot, I'll jot it on a post-it and put it like mm. on my desk because, and I have, I have color coded post-its for each project. So like, if I have a project oh. that's, if I'm like, oh, I, I'm not working on this project right now, but I had this thought and I want mm. to remember it, I'll just jot it on, on a post or like a note card or something and just put it in or help, sometimes I'll have like a notebook for each project so that I can sort of organize like this goes here, this goes here so that when mm. I'm actually getting to the point of writing it, I'll have all those ideas in one place. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. I did I didn't think about color coding posters. Very, That's a great idea. I'm very my brain is very neurotic about colors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's a great way to organize. I mean, yeah, and it gets it off out of your brain and onto a piece of paper. So that's yeah. that's great. Okay, so you're on highest now you're able to focus on your next projects. Um what else is I mean just you can speak generally about this, but what's yeah. what's next on your plate? What's coming up for you? So, I mean, Roswell may or may not come back. Um, so if it does, hopefully I'll get to go back there. And, you know, if not, then I'll hopefully go somewhere else. You know, you kind of, that's, that's, I think the weird thing about this business is there's just long periods of who knows what my next job is going to be and if it's going to be and when it's going to be. And you sort of have to just, you know, be responsible about saving money and uh, try to not be too neurotic about it. I think the first, the first couple jobs you're like, panicked because you're like, I'm never going to work again. And then a <laughs> few times you're like, okay, I guess I'll work again. Like it's, I seem to keep working. So I guess I'll just not be so neurotic about it. Um, but yeah. And, and so I'm trying to take this and for when I have the time off, I try to be very, um, precious in terms of saying like, okay, this is my time that I, I don't get this. You know, I, I don't know when this is going to end, but it might end tomorrow. And so I want to be, you know, efficient with it and, and productive during it. And, um, you know, so, so right now I'm working on, uh, 
couple feature ideas, uh, movie ideas that um, mm -hmm. I've been excited about. One's a one's a zombie movie, and one's like an action rom com. So um, we'll sort of you know, and 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 you know, with, with those things, it's like I figure I'll write the script, and then you know, if I'm on a show, I send it to my agents. My agents send it out. I take meetings. I, I sell it or I don't. You know, there's there's mm -hmm. just sort of like once I've written, it's out it's out of my hands, which is a nice. <laughs> Which is yeah. how I prefer it. You, uh, there's also, you know, you can go and pitch things, which is, I, I just find it a lot more stressful because I spend my whole day being like, okay, I have this pitch in two hours and I got to be really prepared. And then, okay, it's the pitch. I'm on. Okay, pitch, pitch, pitch. And then, okay, yeah. and then, okay, got to come down, got to come. And like, that's your whole day. And I'm just like, it's just not my personality. So, yeah. Like, I, I'm just going to try to, this, this is at least my new theory, which I don't know. I, I, I think if I could just get better at pitching, I would maybe have a better career, but whatever. Uh, well, I mean, um, speaking for myself, and I'm sure many people agree, like uh, you've had an amazing career so far, like doing very cool shows and you know, you did a trilogy of books. That's so impressive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I imagine too, like that uh, it, it's kind of interesting to me, like your your book work and the work you're doing outside TV is sort of like the the slow burn stuff you come back to every time you take a break yeah. from the show. It's nice that you've got like this sort of cycle, you know, how you're working and so forth. Yeah. Um, do you have time for one more question? Of course, I'll yeah. say this one more question. Okay, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, Dia had one more question for you, so. Okay, so the question was, uh, what was your process for finding uh, these kind of gigs initially, or how did you come about scripting for shows? Uh, that's another great question. Yeah. Great questions. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the, there's the sort of old Hollywood adage of, you know, it's who you know. And, and I had gone to USC for screenwriting, which is they have a really good program. But I mean, the, the primary reason it's good is that so many of their alums have like made it out into the business. And so, you know, the idea is like you make friends with the people in your program and then together you sort of help each other move up, which is absolutely like what my friend group did you know I was not the first one to get a job a couple of them you know got their first jobs and then when you know somebody got the, the first my, my one friend got a job she got like my dream my dream job she was like the the PA on this show where I was like oh my god I want to work on that show so badly mm -hmm. uh, I was so jealous uh, and then like four months later her boss, or like another person on the show got fired and she got promoted and her job was available and she recommended me for it and I interviewed and I got it so it's oh. you know, it's a lot of like you know net networking in terms but but networking in terms of like just being friends with people who are you know at that sort of entry level people who are at your level and able to say like okay I know her she's cool I'll help her get a job um and so you know I mean that's that's the in many ways the the least fair thing about Hollywood but in many ways there are many other unfair things about Hollywood. So, um. yeah I, I freelance writing very similar you know I'd have to I didn't get my first uh major magazine gig until I actually went to like a convention and just was sort of doing like a, a presentation. Um, and I met the editor, Calvin Reed with Publishers Weekly. And I was like, yeah, I want to write for you. We've been emailing for months, you know, but once you made that, made that first like connection, it was just a lot more personal. And that's got to be hard for a lot of new writers now, like when you're just on a screen, right? How do you yeah, do I, I really don't know how anyone's doing it right now because zoom is just you're not building the same level of connection but um right you know i i hope that as things are opening up that people are able to to do that more i don't know i i have i will i will say like i've been in a couple different zoom rooms and definitely have i mean and, and now have like made friends outside of the room but like you know there, there are people in those rooms that i uh um i now consider good friends so i, I think it's possible um mm -hmm. but, you know, but but again like that's people who i spent you know months and months every day you know that like that's the kind of networking that you like you want to like get to know people very well so that they know you like as a person in addition mm -hmm. to and you know yeah and you know obviously a lot you know a lot of it comes down to to just practice and you know the the other thing about rooms is like so i you know i started off as the person getting coffee and then i got promoted to be the person who proofread scripts and i did that for maybe five six years Mm -hmm. um and 
you know, in that time, you know, it, it wasn't just I was building the connections. I was also sort of observing and on multiple different shows saying, okay, how, how does this room work? How does this showrunner write their scripts, revise their scripts? You know, what mm -hmm. is the process? And also what are the sort of the social dynamics of a room? Because there's, you know, there's a lot of, of kind of politics that, that you have to learn how to navigate because, you know, a part, part of Hollywood, it, the, the stereotype again is correct is that there's just like a lot of, you know, colorful personalities that, you know, you gotta deal with everyone's unresolved baggage that they didn't go to therapy for. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like there's a real value in just saying like, I want to absorb what's actually going on, right? I can read about this stuff. I can do hear about this in the interviews, but actually being okay with it, like you're going to be a PA or you're going to do something that's more of a, yeah. uh, I guess in a like, more like uh, passive or uh, less active and involved like role, you know, and it could be really yeah. interesting. I'm sure you came in with a lot of, you know, yeah. Preparation uh, mentally, emotionally, you know, before you started doing more of some of the heavy lifting, I guess, just yeah. to mix all these different metaphors. But yeah. Yep. Um, well, Sarah, this has been excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank and you for um, me. yeah, and good luck with your next projects. And you'll have to let us know how it goes. And I'll, I'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, and, uh, and good luck to, to all of you guys. Um, uh, keep, keep, me, keep me posted if. Um, you know, yeah, if people have other questions, they can ask you and I'm glad to forward on answers or, you know. Yeah. Just, yeah. And you're on Twitter, right? I'm on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where I know you, you yeah. talked about a lot of uh, folks. Over. Over there. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, I post like once a week or something like that. But yeah. Um, anyways, yeah. Have a great rest of the day and uh, good luck. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, that was excellent. Um, what a great chat. I am uh, just so, so grateful to, to Sarah for her time she gave us um, here on the stream. And yeah, I mean, every time I do these, these conversations with writers, I leave with a lot more ideas than I started with, right? About just, uh, you know, what it's like to, in her case, like work through all these different sort of channels and collaborators um, in the pursuit of completing a project. So, you know, um, as she, she sort of mentioned, like just from the beginning, the kind of ideation that you'll see on a stream or not a stream, but like in a, in a writer's room, um, you know, can be, uh, you've got a lot of voices already in the mix. And again, that was so interesting to think about, um, how, you know, line producers and so forth can, can shape different parts of a script or an idea. And then even when she's sitting down with actors, she's talking to the director who's then talking to the actors, which is then share, who then the director sharing information with her. I mean, um, I think that if you are doing any kind of collaborative projects for classes, looking at how um, writers and writers rooms like the ones that she, um, Sarah mentioned can be really interesting for, you know, how to kind of resolve issues, right? Um, you're going to have differing opinions about the overall thesis of a project um, or maybe the delivery mode. So maybe somebody wants to do a video, someone wants to do a kind of an audio podcast with a transcript. Um, how do you kind of negotiate those differences? Maybe you've had some of those experiences as well. Um, so let's just recap a couple things, and I think we'll wrap up just a little early uh, for this one, because um, after this, I'm uh, I'm just, again, kind of blown away by what Sarah was saying. It was really, really interesting, um, and I'll look back on this uh, interview very fondly. So we talked about a couple things. I mentioned Call Me Writer once again on minimalist writing platforms. I think that there's something to be said about distraction-free platforms and the kind of feelings we bring to a project. Again, if you're formatting text all the time, maybe that's because you're trying to get it to look just right. And this kind of takes away, you know, maybe those kind of feelings you might you might bring to it. Um, and I think that if we also look back at this conversations we had in November, especially with Robert Feisler on self-care and the writing process, that's another way of thinking about um, our emotional relationships we have with our particular texts. Uh, so, Sometimes self-care means taking a pause from what you're doing, whether it's uh, doing some research or really anything else you've got that's kind of giving you some stress in your life 
and stepping away. So if you want to get a different perspective on um, emotion, do check out that interview because I think it was really interesting. In fact, uh, Robert Pfizer was talking to us from a actual writing retreat that he was on while he was working on his book. And um, we also even talked about non-writing moments that kind of figure into the process uh, and, you know, sort of what the, the benefits have been have been for him. Okay, so a couple things coming up. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, we have uh, just a few streams left. So writing through blocks and problems is next. Um, we'll be talking about just some different strategies for breaking through. And what I like about this stream is some of this ideas come up um, from past streams, right? They, they're, we try to shed new light on, on ideas. So if we've talked about distraction free and kind of problems, which may be a problem in your view, um, how do we work through that? But also like, what does it mean to work through writer's block? Is it a thing that you have found yourself facing before? Uh, do you think it exists? There, that's even been a discussion that people have had. Uh, writing in Markdown for the webs is next. So if you don't know what Markdown is, it's a kind of simplified language for doing HTML writing and coding. So we're going to talk through some of those strategies and we'll even do some writing time so I can show you so what, what the shorthand um, sort of uh, pieces are to that actual language. So we'll look at that and then we'll do an open a workshop on your major writing projects. So um, I'll show you what I'm working on. We can do some writing together. We can also um, even share if you know anybody who wants to workshop their project on the stream, feel free to let me know. I'm always open to guests, as you know, and I feel, feel like they um, always enrich the conversations and the topics that are at hand. And then we'll end with writing games and games about writing. So I think we're going to turn back to, which I think we did in the fall, but I can't remember quite um, at this moment. But we'll look at the game Kind Words and other games that encourage writing. And these aren't so much um, games for like literacy and so forth, but games that think about writers. Um, or use language and words in very interesting ways. So we may also look at Griftlands. It's um, a little bit more on the uh, violet side, but it also has a really great mechanic that encourages persuasion um, in lieu of violence. So something that I certainly think that is timely as well, given what we're, we're, what's going on in the world at the moment. So other than that, folks, uh, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, let me know if you have any other comments in the chat or um, in the comments later on as this is sort of archived. But uh, other than that, folks, have a great rest of the day and we'll speak to you soon. Okay.